Africa is a global leader in women's public leadership, as noted in a Brookings Institute article written by Liberia's former president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Nonetheless, for many women across the 54 nations that makes the continent, getting into prominent positions of leadership still remains a distant dream. At the same time, we are witnessing many stepping down and their positions not being replaced by equal numbers of women. Also in the West, several women in prominent leadership positions have recently been seen resigning. On today's program, we will examine what more can be done to empower women to go into leadership in Africa and around the world. What challenges still need to be confronted so that they can step up, lead, and not give up when the going gets tough. Thank you for joining us. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Oriani Tangishaka, and this is Our Voices. I'm joined by my colleague, Semene Shakoye. Amina Aliyu is off. Our guest host on today's show is Africa Division's Selem Salomon. Hi, ladies. Thank you. Now, ladies, elections are happening in Nigeria this weekend, and noted by a recent Al Jazeera article, half of Nigeria's uh, estimated 210 million people are women. But only one woman has ever occupied any of the top four positions in governance, uh, and that was a speaker in 2007. And the article also points out that this is the case in many African countries, and that this also uh, has been since 1960 in Nigeria. So do you think that this is just the way it is and the way it's going to continue to be, or is there really hope? Seminus. Well, this is a tragedy, not only in Nigeria, but as you pointed out in most African countries and also, you know, around the world, except maybe a few countries. I can point out two reasons for that. One is poverty. I think poverty really plays a big role in denying women the financial and the educational capacity for them to come to leadership positions. And the second, which I think is also the most important one, is the system that is not ready for women to come into. You know, political systems are traditionally set up uh, uh, to exclude women by default. Mm. And we are struggling to push women into this system. And uh, sometimes I think it can be frustrating and it can be so hard for, the, for them to stay mm. into. Is right. there hope, Salomon? Well, is, is there hope? I, I, I would like to think there is hope. I mean, if you think about the continent uh, of Africa, uh, you see a lot of women that came uh, out of the continent holding high-level positions in world organizations. I mean, if you see um, Ngozi, uh, Ogoje, Iwela, uh, you know, the World Health Organization, I mean, trade organization, uh, and also other leaders that have held UN positions, very prominent women. Uh, even in the African Union, you, you have uh, Binta Diop, who's the uh, you, you know, special envoy. So there's hope in terms of positions outside the continent. Unfortunately, uh, inside the continent, there's a, a trend of decline, a, a slow pace of of, of women uh, holding positions. Uh, I'd like to mention one, since we are talking about Nigeria is having an election, I'd like to talk about women who use their position to empower other women mm -hmm. so that not just at the highest level, not just the presidency or the prime minister's position or other prominent positions, but at the local level, mm -hmm. you know, in their states and regions, uh, there's one woman that comes to mind. Her name is Hafsat Abiola. She's the daughter of a previous, uh, uh, he's very revered in, in, in Nigeria. You see his name in streets, uh, MKO Abiola. Mm -hmm. He ran for presidency in 1993, uh, but uh, uh, you know, the military took over and, and, and didn't annul the, the election. Anyway, right. she has carried her parents' mm. tragic um, loss, uh, and lega but carried their legacy mm. to, to push for women yeah. in politics, yeah, which is very we encouraging. We need those individuals, you know, mm -hmm. to see them as an example mm -hmm. uh, to set up, um, you know, for, for others to see and, you know, be inspired to come into uh, a leadership position. Still in Nigeria, Africa's most populous democracy, the number of women running for election this month and in March has declined at almost every level. Against all odds, Juliet Isi Ikaire, a 28-year-old lawyer, is now running for the House of Representatives in the Federal Capital Territory. Let's take a look. In Saturday's Nigerian elections, women are running for just 10% of state assembly seats, 9% of House seats, 8% of Senate seats, and 6% of governorships. 
Juliet Isi Ihaire explains why she is a candidate. I have the mindset that once we are continuing to advocate for a right society, a lot of people will be uh, encouraged, a lot of people will now see themselves to actually do the same thing. But if we continue to complain and sit on the fence, then we are actually multiplying the issues of society through that. Due to ingrained cultural and religious beliefs, some women struggle to see female candidates as potential leaders. Although the percentage of women running for office is still low, the acceptance of female candidates appear to be growing. We also have the challenges of uh, some women will actually see that a white woman, do you think you can run? But the thing is that even in as much as we continue to encourage them that it's not about gender, it's about the ability to be able to serve and being able to think because governance is about being able to think and relate with people. Then the other challenge is about some harassment, so we want to harass you when you come to the public space. But we've been able to use good words, diplomacy to be able to uh, level all this. Saturday's election holds immense significance for young Nigerians, particularly in light of the nation's economic difficulties, insecurity, and the appearance of exclusion of young people from the political process. We need young people to be there. We want all these old ones to be flushed because we, we, we are sick and tired of them. So let them just give those younger ones chance and let the younger ones take control at least for the next four years. Let's see. The, the distinct difference between the younger ones and the older ones because definitely there must be difference. Their own thinking and those ones will not be the same. That is the truth. That governance is truly, truly possible and that the new Nigeria is possible with each and every one of us joining hands together to doing the right thing. Saturday's election is likely to be one of the closest polls in the history of Nigeria. For more perspective on this topic, we've invited Anita Plummer, assistant professor and director of undergraduate study at Howard University's Center for Women's Gender and Global Leadership in Washington, D.C. Ms. Plummer, thank you so much for being with us and helping us uh, dissect uh, a bit about the challenges that women go through in politics. Now, in Kenya recently, um, if you remember, uh, a senator, Senator Gloria Oroba, was uh, pushed out of uh, uh, parliament because of a period stain. It wasn't really a period stain, it was more of a protest uh, trying to highlight the period shame situation. Um, and this happened in parliament. Now, do you think that these kind of moves happen in parliament when it's not really allowed? The, uh, the, the, the Kenyan parliament, the standing order doesn't allow protest in the parliament, but still, we still see these protests happening. Uh, do you think it's a strategy that women are using uh, because their voices aren't being heard elsewhere to try to push legislation, uh, or is it really just a strategy like others? So Senator Aroba's very intentional and deliberate tactic to bring attention to the need for girls to have access to sanitary products is a very important issue that women have been encountering and fighting for across the continent. It's a tactic that is rooted historically in cultural practices across Africa. So what comes to mind are the naked protests in Nigeria. During the colonial period up until 2022, women would take to the streets topless to demand um, responsiveness from political leaders. So for example, unreasonable taxes, economic insecurity. So using the body as a form of power to bring attention to these issues explicitly applies pressure to men um, and it signals to women that you know even though women tend to be excluded from formal political processes there are ways that we can engage um, in ways to bring uh, these critical issues to attention so with senator arwoba we know that it was it was uh, very deliberate she had on a beautiful cream color suit with a red stain. And this is something that women encounter, you know, from um, elementary school up until, you know, menopause. We have to deal with this and putting it in the face of men, uh, I think is really important because women and their family <laughs> have to deal with these issues. So it's not as if it's a foreign issue, um, the issue of equal access to sanitary products. It's just important that it's elevated to the public space, space when we talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the pressure that keeps especially women in Africa away from uh, leadership positions. Uh, it could start from the sanit access to sanitary products, you know, access to education. So uh, what are the main uh, uh, pressures or obstacles for women in Africa uh, from coming to any kind of leadership position, even from governing or being elected into parliament? 
It's very complicated, and I think it's very case and culturally specific. So we can make some generalizations, you know, taking a 30,000 foot view. But I think we have we would have to do a deep dive into the political cultures of specific communities. So one thing that comes to mind is political engagement. Who is voting? Who has access to the ballot? And how does that translate to decision making power at different levels? So oftentimes we think about the pipeline to leadership, right? Leaders are not born, they're cultivated and they're trained up to be leaders. So political parties, very concretely, political parties on the local level have to be very deliberate in cultivating leaders and supporting them as they move through the ranks. So many political parties across Africa actually have quotas in place where a certain number of elected officials have to be women, right? But that doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, it's about getting constituencies mobilized and empowered. Um, so those women, as they move up the ranks, they have a support system um, to rely on. Um, in terms of other barriers, um, there have to be support networks for women leaders. Um, we brought up the cases uh, of the women who've rose, risen to power those are very rare cases, right? And many of those women are first. So what does it mean to create um, women-led, you know, support networks in which we talk about issues like family life balance, in which we talk about, you know, okay, if most of the decision-making power is still in the hands of men and you are the figurehead as a woman, how do you navigate those different spaces? Um, I would also um, say that compensation is real, you know, so if you have young women who are political leaders and they need help, you know, at home with the children, ensuring that uh, there are very tangible supports for um, these aspiring political leaders and those already in office. All right. Uh, thank you for that perspective, uh, Anita. Uh, you mentioned cultivating leaders. So. I'm wondering what's uh, really a bigger factor? Is it uh, making sure that working that society accepts women as uh, rightful leaders or is it encouraging women themselves to push despite all the obstacles? Wh which one is the bigger, bigger factor here? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a both and situation. One, if there aren't incentives for women to enter the political space publicly, if there isn't a support system, women aren't going to do it. So the clip that you just showed of um, uh, the campaign or campaigning is extremely public and extremely difficult. So culturally, if women are perceived as dominating the domestic sphere, if women's place is viewed as being nurturers, caregivers, mothers, and they're not perceived as political leaders, that cultural shift gradually needs to happen, especially among women themselves because it becomes a confidence issue. It becomes a resource issue. Um, women leaders are particularly vulnerable in the age of social media. We've seen this. Women have been publicly attacked for um, claiming public spaces. So cultural shifts have to happen, but there also have to be intentional policies. Um, the quota system is one example, but being deliberate in terms of moving women through the pipeline, right? So a woman, before she can become senator, before she can become president, she has to pay her dues on the local level, right? She has to navigate these structures, build support systems, build networks. Political parties need to build that in to their strategies um, in a very um, particular way and target different women audiences, whether it's on a multi-generational level, on a regional level, um, looking at it uh, uh, in terms of uh, class, uh, these different strategies need to happen. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, so many factors uh, involved in that. Uh, we'll come back to expand uh, and continue the conversation. Uh, but now uh, we'll, it's time for a quick break. Uh, before we break, in today's Your Voice segment, we will hear what women in the streets of Nairobi have to say about the challenges they see for women leadership positions. I think they face many challenges. One, there is that down degradement of women when women in leadership a woman in leadership is not respected the same way as a man in leadership. And also, 
at some point whatever she vents out it is taken on a higher note rather than on an equal note it is true women are under pressure and at times a woman has a lot to take care of she has to work she has to go home family stuff even when it comes to delivering she may not deliver the best because she has a lot on her plate so at times we need to understand them in a different perspective despite their leaders we need to understand their mothers their parents it is you men who put pressure on them there is a point when men stand up and they say it's not a must for them to be led by women there is a group saying they cannot be led by women and if a female arrives at the same village, people from that very village will say, we are not the people to be led by women. Even when she arrives, she won't get the information that she needs. It is so hard for her. She wants to work for the people, but men won't recognize her in leadership. Like the other day, whatever happened in parliament of that lady, who was on her periods. Eh? I don't know how true that is, but we assume that was the truth. You see, it was taken on a negative note. These are some of the challenges. Uh, when you get pregnant and you're needed in parliament, so it, it becomes a challenge. You feel that you're like sidelined. You're not able to express yourself fully. The other day we saw how Karen was dressed. That raised a lot of questions in parliament, of which to me she was just decently dressed. We are really facing so many challenges huh? as women, especially when you become a mother. And there's nothing you can do. The society needs to create a forum whereby we are embraced all, all round when you become pregnant after giving birth, such. Those were women from Kenya. We just heard from about what they think about female leadership. Uh, when we return, we'll discuss a bit deeper about the female leaders around the world that recently left their prominent position. Don't forget to share your thoughts on today's topic on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook at VOA Africa, Instagram and Twitter handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp and our number is country code plus one two zero two five zero three nine zero two five. Stay with us. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. Well, welcome back. You're watching Our Voices. And let's now discuss the low number of prominent women leaders on the continent and around the world. In the past 10 years, Africa has seen more than five female leaders leave or step down from power. Liberia's Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Mauritius's Amina, Ferdouos Garib Fakim, and Malawi's Joyce Vanda were some of the heads of state who have left office. Currently on the continent, the only female heads of state are the president of Ethiopia, Sahalawa Kazode, and the president of Tanzania, Samia Salihu Hussein. As was mentioned earlier, this phenomenon has been witnessed around the world as prominent women leave their jobs to pursue other interests and focus on other priorities. VOA's Laurel Bowman has the story for us. Some of the world's female leaders are quitting. In Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon recently announced her resignation as First Minister, citing the heavy personal toll of political life. Since my very first moments in the job, 
I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to make way for someone else. It will help us to build a future. In New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern stepped down in January as Prime Minister. While rising inflation had dented her party's popularity, Ardern cited the demands of motherhood as a top reason for leaving. I know what this job takes, and I know that I no longer have enough in the tank to do it justice. In the U.S. House of Representatives, politician Nancy Pelosi in November relinquished her role as the top House Democrat. And in Africa, head of the Ethiopian Supreme Court, Misa Ashinafi, resigned in January. Is this the great resignation of women leaders? I think what we see in the great resignations of women leaders is that the ecosystem is not women friendly. I think it is important for us to look at these structures and systems and institutions that were historically created and defined by men, that they no longer are sustainable. Meanwhile, research by LeanIn.org and McKinsey and Company suggests that women in business want better pay and more flexibility at work and are prepared to switch jobs to get it. And they are more likely to want to work from home perhaps to care for family. I think it is getting more acceptable to be a caregiver in leadership. And some research shows that the less gentle and more assertive a woman leader seems, the more unlikable she is perceived to be, even by other women. Former Malawi President Joyce Banda told The Guardian newspaper that her biggest critics tended to be women. In cultures, where female leadership has long been institutionalized, uh, such as in Scandinavia, then there is very high support for female leaders and indeed uh, almost half their leadership is female. Upon handing over the gavel, former Speaker of the U.S. House Pelosi marveled at how many more women are serving in the chamber than when she joined 35 years ago. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We are discussing what can be done to empower women women come to into leadership position. We, we have with us Anita, Miss Anita Plummer. Uh, she is assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies at Howard University Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership in Washington, D.C. Miss Plummer, thank you for being with us. And let's uh, see, like we, we discussed earlier that quite a few women have managed to come to leadership, but they are coming into a system that um, entertains policies and practices that still discriminates women. So how can we bring that fundamental shift uh, in governance or organizational structure to make women be effective in leadership? Absolutely. I think it's very important that um, we highlight that the systems have failed these leaders. These structures have failed these leaders. It's not a failure of these women. And there are direct interventions that can happen structurally, but culture also needs to change gradually. Um, so if political leadership is often perceived as masculine and women leaders are often viewed as threatening, what will change that is having more women leaders actually in leadership at all levels um, and shifting, you know, these very patriarchal views of identity being linked to the domestic sphere um, and the expectations that women be uh, on the background or not enter political office. So these cultural expectations have to happen. The cultural shifts have to happen. And they begin with conversations. Um, I think capturing the experiences of women leaders that have stepped down, whether it's um, the argument that familial obligations um, are preventing them from pursuing politics, or if it's issues related to mental health and self-care, we have to bring these conversations out to the open and give space for women leaders to express their experiences in a very genuine way. If we have these conversations like the one we're having today, these structures can be dismantled. 
and the perceptions of who makes a good leader will change. This idea that politics is all or nothing, winner take all, um, that leaders have to sacrifice themselves at the altar of the public is not a very productive and sustainable way for our systems um, to thrive. So the conversations have to happen. Now, Ms. Ms. Plummer, let's talk about education. How can education on a global scale be more um, be efficient or even enable women to go into leadership on a global scale, what can we do? There have been actually studies that have shown that women's access to education beyond primary and secondary school is an indicator of political involvement. These are studies not only in the West, but also look across Africa. So the more access to education a woman has over the course of her lifetime, and it actually has a generational impact her children will be more likely to be politically engaged. You'll find that the women who have risen to power, a lot of them have been very highly educated and come from families that support education. So that's another very concrete uh, policy shift that can happen that will again increase the women in the pipeline. Mm. Anita Plummer, thanks so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts on this topic. Anita Plummer is a professor, um, uh, assistant professor and director uh, of uh, undergraduate study at Howard University Center of Women and Gender and Global Leadership in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges that can be confronted. Uh, but I think Anita, what Anita gave us uh, in terms of education, uh, what can be done on a global scale is something that, to, that we should be hopeful that can change to help women come into leadership. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always wondered why, I mean, when politicians, women politicians are in a place of power, mm -hmm. uh, how do they advocate for issues that are, you know, specific to gender without women. that issue being about gender? Mm -hmm. You understand? The mm -hmm. fact that they're not hopefully not pigeonholed um, yeah. because of the their... system also has a place in that. Yeah. Well, that's all for us this week. Special thanks to uh, our guest, Anita Plummer from the University of Howard. Thanks, of course, our guest host, Salem Salomon, for being with us, and my co-host, of course, Lily Seminish. Uh, on behalf of Voice of America, this is our Voices. I'm Oriani Tangishaka. Thank you for being with us.